Good evening. On behalf of President Gilmore and Provost Starkey, welcome to the Pennsylvania College of Technology's Fall 2018 Colloquium entitled The Limits of Modern Warfare, Stalemate, Technology, and the Asanzo Front in the First World War. My name is Patrick Marty. I serve as Chief of Staff at the College. Uh, in my role as a connector, I've been asked to introduce our speaker this evening, and I'm honored and delighted to do so. First, I should tell you that the, Pennsylvania, or the Penn College Colloquial Series honors uh, Daniel J. Doyle, a professor emeritus, and the college's 1984 master teacher. And it features presentations by noted authors and academics who challenge their audiences to consider the impact of technology on society. Now, I say I'm a connector because I was approached by Nancy Dorman of the Notre Dame Club of Greater Williamsport about a wonderful collaborative opportunity through the University of Notre Dame's Hesburgh Lecture Series. The Reverend Theodore M. Hesburgh, CSC, or Father Ted, as many of us know him, not only served as the university's president from 1952 to 1987, but he also led its singular transformation from a Midwestern Catholic football school to a globally recognized research university that it is today. Larger than that, he was a national leader for change in civil rights, higher education, and the church. He's widely acknowledged as a principal architect of the Civil Rights Act, and his public service ranged from 14 years on the International Atomic Energy Agency to chairman of the Rockefeller Foundation, from U.S. immigration and refugee policy to U.N. human rights efforts, from opposing the spread of nuclear weapons to negotiating Israeli-Palestinian intentions and promoting democracy in Latin America. He was both an advisor and envoy for presidents and popes, but he stood up to both. He was the only priest to ever serve as governor at Harvard University, and he received a record 150 honorary degrees before his passing in 2015 at the age of 97. Father Ted credits a sign during his 1943 ordination as a Holy Cross priest is the inspiration for his remarkable American life. The sign is a literal one. It is these four words, touchstone for any alumnus, and the title of Ted's autobiography that are inscribed in a door lintel at the Basilica of the Sacred Heart, God, Country, Notre Dame. And that same stone lintel just so happens to sit directly above the Basilica's World War I memorial door where the names of Notre Dame's 56 gallant dead from the First World War are listed. Inspired by his example of lifelong learning, the Hesburgh Lecture Series showcases the depth and breadth, breadth of Notre Dame's academic expertise in research and teaching, and it furthers the university's mission to provide meaningful continuing education opportunities to Notre Dame alumni and friends, community members, and, as tonight, partners like the Pennsylvania College of Technology. Together, the partnership of Notre Dame Club of Greater Williamsport and Penn College secured tonight's speaker on an auspicious anniversary given this topic. This evening, we are on the cusp of the 100th anniversary of Armistice Day, commemorating the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month that hostilities ended in the most violent human clash humanity had ever seen until the next one came along. Kurt Vonnegut wrote about Armistice Day in his 1973 novel, Breakfast of Champions. It is during that minute in 1918 that millions upon millions of human beings stopped butchering each other. I have talked to old men who were on battlefields during that minute. They have told me in one way or another that the sudden silence was the voice of God. So we still have among us men who can remember when God spoke clearly to mankind. The First World War has been well documented for, bro for broadening the gap between technological advances and the limits of mankind in warfare. But in one corner of the Great War, about which Americans know little, a brutal series of battles illustrates the limits of both in the face of nature. Dr. John Dayak is Associate Professor of History at the University of Notre Dame and a fellow at the Nanavik Institute for European Studies. He received his BA from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill and his PhD from the University of Chicago. Broadly interested in European history since the Enlightenment, he teaches courses on German history, the revolutions of 1848, the First World War, and his specialty, the history of the Habsburg Empire. Please join me in offering a warm Williamsport welcome to Dr. John Dayak.
Thanks, Pat, for that kind introduction. And it was sort of brilliant how you tied everything together. Um, thank, thank you very much. Um, I want to thank you all for coming, for spending a Thursday evening with me um, when you could be doing something else. I want to thank everyone here at Penn College who have just made me feel so at home in your classes and, um, and on campus. And I want to also thank the Notre Dame Alumni Association um, for sponsoring me and bringing me here, um, or for partially sponsoring me and bringing me here, and for selecting me um, as one of these lecturers that they want to send out into the world. And while I'm on the subject of alumni, I have to mention my own students. Since 2013, I've had the privilege to teach a freshman introductory course in the First and Second World Wars, as well as a senior research seminar on the First World War. And so much of what I'm going to talk about today reflects the thinking um, and the teaching and the learning that I've done alongside my students who have, um, who have influenced me greatly. And what I, I know there are many students here, as a, and in, in addition to people from, from the greater Williamsport area and from the Penn College faculty. But I want to speak to the students directly and tell and remind them how much and how much influence you have on the learning that goes on in this campus. Not just your own, but on the people teaching you. The way that you challenge the people who teach you is, going, is, is inspirational for what they do. So keep learning and keep coming and keep being a student for as long as you can. <laughs> um, finally, I'd like to acknowledge all of my colleagues and friends in the Republic of Slovenia, especially my, my good friend, Dr. Miha Shimac, who have shared their time and their expertise with me, um, especially navigating um, the, the mountainous roads, some of which you might see here. Um, I was always the driver, and he was telling me where to go. Um, but uh, you, know, you need a good map reader, because Google doesn't work in these mountains. All right. Um, I hope I didn't miss anyone. Our understanding of the First World War is shaped largely by metrics at this point. Human memory of the First World War has faded away. We are the veterans of the First World War that we could talk to um, have passed, in, especially in the last 10 years. Um, the oldest ones have died. And our understanding of the First World War shaped by these metrics is usually shaped by the number of 11 million, 11 million dead, over billions of billions of shells fired, produced and fired, 1.5 billion artillery shells on the Western Front alone, the Western Front that we as Americans learn about because that's where most Americans ended up serving, but also we tend in America to reflect history written in English, history written by English people, English speakers. And they served on the Western Front in large numbers as well. And of course, metrics don't tell us everything. As this photo shows us from Passchendaele in 1917, shows us a scarred and dead landscape. So we know in our, in our guts that the world, uh, the world of the First World War should be understood more than just numbers and metrics. There's an emotional quality to seeing a wasteland like this. And we can think maybe if we reflect deeply on the psychological toll that living in this space and fighting in this space took on the, took on the people who were there, that makes it maybe a little bit fuller. But a full understanding of what the First World War tends to escape us. We can't really m measure both the depth and the magnitude, not only the numbers. In some ways, our understanding of the First World War in this country is shaped by the war that followed. The Second World War is, is much more important for, for American memory and American experience because so many more men were put under arms in the Second World War. So for us, the Second World War eclipses the first. More men mobilized, and the war itself was more global and raged, ranged from the Pacific to the Atlantic and the coast of the Mediterranean and the depths of the Russian steppes. So in, in essence, the First World War, the war I'm going to talk about tonight, is seen not unjustly as a precursor to the bigger 
and batter Second World War. It's clear when we examine concepts like total war, which I'm sure you've heard of, and it's also clear when we think about industrial production, the, the way that industry is connected to war. The coordination and control of industrial production taken on by states, food rationing, logistics, supply, all of this emerged in the First World War and was largely perfected in terrible forms for many people in the second. So the seminal catastrophe of the First World War is seen in direct relation to what it gives birth to, the world of the 20th century and the Second World War. This photo is a photo from the Skoda factory in Pilsen, which was then in Bohemia in Austria-Hungary. Now it's in the Czech Republic. This was the main armaments factory and factory works for the Austro-Hungarian Empire. When we tie industry to war, we, we again try to measure it in metrics. The number of, of guns produced, the number of shells produced, the number of, of arms produced. But I want to get beyond metrics tonight. So in talking about the Isonzo front of the First World War, I hope to get us to think beyond metrics together. And part of what I'm going to talk about is this. I took this photo in 1915, or 1915, 2015. I was not alive in 1915. <laughs> 2015, 100 years after the war began there. This is the valley of the Kortnitsa River before it joins with the Socha River, which is better known in this country as the Isonzo River. We, use, we tend to use the Italian, but this river flows, begins in the mountains, the Julian Alps of Slovenia, and flows southward through this large valley, crossing into the Ita now the Italian border at the city of Gorizia, and then into the Adriatic Sea. But this valley is beautiful and verdant, and it's also a site of memory for the First World War. It proved deadly for the Italian soldiers who launched multiple assaults here, and a deadly for the Austro-Hungarians who were forced to defend it. Now I'm taking this photo looking northeast down the valley and directly behind me, where I'm standing as I took this photo, is Fort Hermann. The photo here on the left is from 1915 when, the, when Italian artillery destroyed it, or largely destroyed it. The second photo my wife took um, in 2015, 100 years later, when we went on a hike and found a nice sign in Slovenian that told us, enter at your own risk. And we did. We could, we could actually walk inside this fortress. Um, it wasn't exactly safe, but Slovenia is in a litigious society, so we made our way in and looked around. Tonight, I'm, I was tempted to give you a lecture on the triumph of science and research in war and how war is, promotes science and research. But I decided not to talk about it. And just so you know that there are many stories I could tell, um, there were advances in medicine, and ph especially pharmaceuticals, because war and the First World War created a unique uniquely urgent situation and an impetus to solve problems of infection and blood, lo blood loss, blood transfusions. I learned this from one of my students who won, who got an, an award, who wrote an award-winning research paper this semester on blood transfusions, how the First World War really pushed ahead the science of blood transfusions. I could tell you stories like this or advances in other forms of technology like wireless communication that really received a boost in the First World War because it's very difficult to coordinate hundreds of thousands of troops stretched over hundreds of miles. Napoleon did it by sending horses and with signal corps like semaphore. Um, but Napoleon didn't have to deal with such a large front. 
But tonight, I want to talk about lethality in war and the connection between military technology and lethality in war. And to do this, I want to introduce to you and sort of get us to think about this concept of the future imagination. I think important for understanding the First World War and how it gave birth to the Second World War is understanding this concept of a future imagination. And simply this, the chiefs of the general staffs of the great European powers that went to war in 1914 and again in 1915 came of age in the 1880s. They were late Victorians. And understanding how Europe went to war in 1914 means understanding this larger cultural world that they went to war with and also their imagination of what a future war would look like because they were the ones that implemented it. So we have to get inside their heads. We have to understand the politics of budgets and political factors that went into arming the militaries that went to war in the First World War. But we also have to understand their cultural constructions and especially their notions of what it, what it meant to be a soldier. And this is, one, this is a, an interesting photo that I found of German recruits in Alsace. They're being very manly. Europe's armies went to war in the First World War according to the future imaginations of their generals. Their kit and their weapons reflected the imagination of the generals who sent them to war. Central to the generals' imaginations were concepts of tradition and honor and the belief in manliness and what that should look like. And these cultural constructions they had were directly tied to how they strategized going to war and the tactics they implemented and how they outfitted their troops. Central to this was the belief in the offensive as being offense being the key to victory the belief that offense won wars. A quick strike in the face of defensive fire would overpower enemy lines, put the enemy to flight, and demoralize him. This was the central concept that many of the generals worked with. It rendered movement, especially in the face of geography, irrelevant. These generals favored bayonets as the offensive weapon. War planning meant that the kits reflected this. Troops went to war with about eight kilograms of kit, about 16, 17 pounds. They went to war in August of 1914 with no winter gear because war was going to be over quickly. Rifles were bolt action and long on an average between 1.5 and 1.8 meters with a bayonet that made them longer. And they went to war with cloth or leather helmets, hopefully protected by their enthusiasm. <clears throat> so just to get everyone caught up so that we're all on the same page, I'm an historian of Austria-Hungary. And um, this means that everyone thinks that what I study is completely irrelevant, um, anachronistic, and should have been torn down. But it's actually important, and it's important for understanding how the First World War began. In June of 1914, the heir apparent, the, the person who was going to be the th come to the, the empire as the emperor after a, a very old emperor died, was this man, Franz Ferdinand. Franz Ferdinand um, was also the chief inspector of the Austro-Hungarian Armed Forces. And he went on an inspection tour to observe maneuvers in Bosnia, which was a province in the Habsburg Empire. After the inspection tour was over, he was supposed to arrive by car through in Sarajevo um, where there might be a, a slow-moving military parade. And of course, he arrived in this nice Grafenstift convertible. 
I think a 1908 model. While he was in Sarajevo, by, by chance, um, he was assassinated by a group of Bosnian Serbs who may or may not have been funded and trained by Serbian intelligence. They actually missed assassinating him the first time. They threw a bomb at him when he was coming in, but it, it, hit, the, it hit off the car and rolled under the car behind him in the, in the, the caravan um, and blew up there, putting two of Franz, Jos uh, Fr um, Franz Ferdinand's adjutants in the hospital. So Franz Ferdinand visited those men in the hospital and was then going to make his way quickly out of the city so that no assassination attempt, attempt could happen. But as luck would have it, the driver of his car was not informed of the decision to forego the parade route. And he turned off of the quay along the river Miatska to make his way down narrow Franz Josef Street. He turned right here coming and turned right. And at that moment, one of the men on the car, the governor of Bosnia, yelled for the driver to stop. The driver came to a halt right here, right in front of where one of the would-be assassins was standing. They planned to assassinate Franz Ferdinand with grenades which had percussion caps, so you have to break the percussion cap and, and throw the grenade. But he, there were too many people standing on the corner, so he pulled out a Browning pistol, fired two shots into the car, killing both Franz Ferdinand and his wife. Long story short, many diplomatic failures, um, and no one really wanted to have peace. So by August 4th, 1914, the world was at war. We can talk about this in more detail, um, but it was definitely a mess. Italy was allied with Austria, Hungary, and Germany in what was called the Triple Alliance. But Italy did not actually go to war with Austria, Hungary, and Germany. Italy waited. And they were waited for the best deal. Now, to understand why Italy came to war in 1914, we have to, under, I'm going to catch you up on this really quick. We have to understand two things. One, Germans, Germany's big gamble in the West. And two, the destruction of the Habsburg army in the East. These things are actually tied together. Many historians of the First World War like to complain about how bad the Austro Hungarian military is. And I like to be a little bit more fair. Um, Germany, knowing that it was going to fight a two-front war against France and Russia at this point, because Austria-Hungary was going to attack Serbia. Serbia called its friend Russia. Russia was in a defensive alliance with France. And France convinced England to join in. That is the quickest summary I'm ever going to give, and I hope you don't record this and put it on YouTube because well, other historians are now cringing. <laughs> but I've just, I've just summarized like 2,000 pages of literature in 30 seconds. But that's what happened. And Germany, more or less, decides that it's going to array 80% of its army against France because France will mobilize more quickly. And if it knocks out France very quickly in the first six weeks, it hopes, it can then use the rail lines to move its army to the east because Russia is going to mobilize a lot slower. Two things happened. Germany does very well in the first six weeks of the war, but gets bogged down at the Battle of the Marne in the west. France finally has a victory two, after two months of fighting. And the second thing was Russia mobilized a lot faster than anyone ever anticipated. And it Russia knew what it was doing, decided to bring most of its men under arms against Austria-Hungary, trying to knock it out of the war more quickly. Because Austria-Hungary couldn't field as many divisions as Germany could. 
So while Germany is bogged down in the West, this is the, the famous Schlieffen plan, where Germany hopes to encircle the French army and knock them out. Austria-Hungary is left to defend the East, mostly by itself for the first four months of the war against the superior numbers of the Russians. The Western Front solidifies, Germany is bogged down, and the Eastern Front turns into a disaster for Austria-Hungary. One point two five million, so one and a quarter million Russian troops under arms face a vastly outnumbered Habsburg army. And in the course of the first four months of the war in 1914, so by December 1914, they've largely annihilated the Habsburg army. Over 400,000 casualties were suffered by the Habsburg professional military in the first four months of the war. The Habsburg army, the standing army of the Habsburg Empire on wartime footing in 1914 was about 800,000. The Habsburg Empire is able to raise more troops, but this is no longer going to be a professional army by 1915. It's going to be a recruit army. And Germany is bogged down in the West, but the, by the time the front solidifies, it's able to send troops to shore up the Habsburg Empire in the East. So by the beginning of 1915, we have stalemate. Stalemate is a key component for understanding everything I'm going to talk about today and understanding the First World War and why it was so horrible and, and terrific and why so many larger societal changes were produced by it. As soldiers hunkered down in defensive trenches and the front solidified, the tactics of the generals still pursued offensive assaults with disastrous results. But the call to the offensive, the, the final belief that offensives win wars, are going to lead, to lead to generals to try to search for new technologies of war that will prove them right, that will prove the offensive, the idea of the, f the faith in the offensive, as ultimately correct. So militaries, over the first few months and years of the war, keep digging in their available toolkits for all sorts of technologies and ways to overcome the enemy in a great break breakthrough. But as they continued to search, they also realized that this was going to be a long war. How do you break a stalemate where a front is largely solidified? First of all, if you're going to keep fighting offensive wars in the stalemate, you have to be willing to accept staggering casualties among your troops. And most of the generals were very willing to do this because they believed that eventually they would break through. But of course, as the war goes on, you also need to make sure that your troops are, su keep, are, are supplied with food and ammunition and weapons beyond what was stockpiled before the war. So you need to take greater economic control of production and industry. And the belligerents will continue to do this. But you also need to find new allies and new fronts. Hopefully you can spread the lines thin. And maybe you can get a breakthrough because you're attacking the, the other, the enemy on multiple fronts. And this is where Italy will come in. And of course you can use technologies that are already available to get people committed to the fight, committed to industrial production through propaganda, but you can also find new technologies. And we're gonna see gas tanks and airplanes destroyed. But I told you about Italy. Italy was nominally allied with Germany and Austria-Hungary, but it did not enter the war at first. It negotiated for land and territory. And the Treaty of London signed in April 1915 by France and Britain, were able to promise 
Italy much more territory than Austria-Hungary and Germany were able to promise it. And that's because Britain and France didn't own the territory they were promising. <laughs> they promised Italy, let's see, let's get the point of work, southern Tyrol, the Austrian littoral, and the coast of Dalmatia. Now to be fair, Italy had its eyes on this territory because Italian speakers had lived there for centuries. But they lived there along with a host of lots of other people. Just like everywhere else in the Habsburg monarchy, it was multi-ethnic and multinational and multilingual. So of, of the territory Italy was promised, there are about 650 Italian, 650,000 Italian speakers living there, along with 230,000 German speakers, and about three quarters of a million Croatians and Slovenians. So Italy promised to enter the war against Austria-Hungary and open what became a third front. Austria-Hungary was forced to face Russia on the Galician and Eastern Front here, Serbia here, and now Italy here. The person put in charge of the Italian, Italy's plan for battle was Luigi Cardona. Cardona was a general, of course, who, had became, who became chief of the general staff only the year before in 1914. And like the generals in Germany and France and Britain and Russia, he was a firm believer in the superiority of offensive tactics. He believed that the army could overtake Austrian positions that were uphill and well entrenched. And his translation, or his ideas of the future war, that the offensive and the spirit of the attackers would win battle, was translated into how the troops were outfitted and how they went to war and how he ultimately command them, commanded them for two and a half years. This is the front we're going to be talking about. This is what's called the Asanzo Front because it's marked by the river Asanzo that flows here. On the left, we see Italian recruits marching off to war in 1915. What do you notice about them? They're happy, they're excited. Light kits, yeah, because you don't want them weighed down. In fact, look at their headgear. Yeah, how does that stop a bullet? And what about, what about, uh, not good for shrapnel either. And how did most of the people in the, in the First World War die? Head wounds, yes. Oh well, Italy will go to war wearing cloth caps. They're going to carry M91 bolt-action rifles that were 50 inches long, 1.3 meters. The bayonet would extend them by another foot or so, which makes them really effective in tight quarters where they were going to be asked to fight. And the military had only 600 machine guns ready in May 1915, but they didn't want to carry more that would just weigh the troops down. Speed and offensives were what won wars after all. What waited for them was an emerging Habsburg army, the emerging fifth army of the Habsburg Empire that was cobbled together very quickly. They knew the invasion was coming and Austria-Hungary was able to transfer troops from the Russian front where they had just secured a breakthrough at Gorlitsa Tarnov and the Serbian front to defend this territory. So what, waited, what awaited Italy was a difficult landscape and Austria-Hungary had all the high ground in the border regions and they were ably led by this general, Svetozar Borijevic, who was of Serbo-Croatian, or Serbian and Croatian extraction. Borijevic knew he was going to face a large number of Italian troops and he was going to be outnumbered. And so he couldn't rely on the, the cult of the offensive to win battles. He didn't have the troops to launch, nor, to launch successful offensives. And he didn't really have cracked troops to do it with. He had some good units, but most of the units he was commanding 
were put together by militia men, people that were um, between 40 and 55 years of age who were, who were th given a uniform and a rifle and told to defend. So Borievich used the landscape, he used the local population, and he used the cult of the offensive to his advantage. In the northern regions of the Asansa River, where we're seeing this here, the mountain peaks can range above 7,000, 8,000 meters tall. The lower Asanzo, which after the town of Caporetto or Cobarid, the Asanzo sort of widens out, it turns greener, and the, the mountains get smaller, but the landscape changes a little bit. The lower Asanzo Valley is dominated by what they call the Karst Plateau, or the Carso in Italian. It's about 500 meters above sea level, and the do it's dominated by rock and limestone. Farming here is difficult. It still is difficult today. The sun bakes the land in the summer, and in the winter, the bora, this famous wind that blows constantly, be 60 to 65 miles an hour, just blows through it. So it's a, it's a really interesting region to study. They make really good prosciutto there, um, the wine is also good, um, but the houses are all made of stone, heavy stone, with stone roofs, because if you have just normal tile roofs, the wind will just blow the tiles off and blow the walls down. The ground is uneven. Here it's full of sinkholes and caves and grottos that are cut by underwater or underground rivers and streams. And historians have often recounted that when shells would hit this rock, the rock would fragment and turn into like shrapnel bursts where soldiers were dying of head wounds from shrapnel even though the, the shells themselves weren't shrapnel, it was rocks. Here the Austrians used drills to cut into the rock and stone and fortify their positions, like here on Mount Sabotin, which is now in Slovenia. The Italians, of course, didn't have drills because that would just weigh them down. And the Austrians also used tools of war that were ready, ready-made, the machine gun and the barbed wire. The Italians weren't weighed down by drills, they weren't weighed down by helmets, they weren't weighed down by artillery, or not even wire cutters or gelignite tubes that could cut open gaps in the barbed wire that the Austrians laid for defense. In fact, in the Asanzo front, barbed wire machine guns turned out to be so decisive that the cult of the offensive waged by Cordona and others couldn't really account for them. How to cut barbed wire that is uphill and machine gun nests hidden behind. France and Germany learned to use heavy artillery to break barbed wire and allow for troops to advance. This is our idea of the First World War. You know, the whistle blows, the troops come out of the trench and rush to the other side after the bombardment because the bombardment has destroyed the barbed wire. Cardona, Cardona didn't have these answers because Italy didn't go to war with any large number of heavy artillery pieces to speak with. Their artillery was too small to actually break the barbed wire, so they had to do it by hand. And this is where two stalemate, just like on the Western Front, set in on the Asanzo. There were 12 battles of the Asanzo River. 12. For over two years, assaults after assaults were launched against Austro-Hungarian defenses. Borjevic's idea as a general was, the Italians can take the first line, that's fine, but we can't let them hold it. As soon as they take any territory, we launch a counterattack and push them out. He did this for over two years. The front stalemated, casualties mounted. In the first 11 battles of the Asanza River, we see over one million casualties, equal to that of the more famous battles of Verdun and the Somme. And when we think about how stalemate and the futility of stalemate can breed innovation, innovation, usually think about how science helps militaries to come up with new weapons. But here's and this does happen. But one of the special things that the stalemate and the long stalemate that World War I bred, especially in the face of generals who refused to rethink their strategies or tactics, 
are homemade inventions by soldiers themselves who have to live through this. And what do we see is, what we see in the First World War are things, what we call, what historians like to call retro innovations. If you're supposed to take an enemy trench and you're given a rifle that is almost two meters long and is a bolt action, that's not gonna be very helpful. So what do you do? You make grenades out of the tin cans that your rations come in because they weren't supplied with grenades. Those were old fashioned by the First World War. Many armies didn't supply their troops with grenades right away. Or you make clubs and maces. How many of you guys, you students, play Battlefield One or play Battlefield One? And you like the trench raider kit? Well, guess what? That is actually not so far from the truth. Trench raiders like to make their own homemade weapons. It's often recounted, but I haven't been able to find this anywhere, that Bosnians especially like maces. <laughs> but why not? Soldiers made their own brass knuckles and clubs and maces as a way of taking trenches because most of the, the, the warfare that happened between soldiers was hand-to-hand -hand combat and close quarter killing. There are other two retro, there are, there's another retro innovation that I want to talk about and it's usually what First World War historians miss. The most famous retro innovation that soldiers came up with and then armies supplied them with was the steel helmet. Most historians of the First World War like to say the steel helmet first saw wide use in the First World War. But we're forgetting that knights went to war with steel helmets all of the time. And one of the reasons why steel helmets became so important was because of the use of artillery and head wounds. And soldiers were outfitting themselves in steel helmets that were not issued by the governments. In fact, um, in France, what you see is soldiers borrowing firemen's helmets from their cousins in the fire department. Until by 1916, all armies are now trying to come up with a standardized steel helmet. It does not stop bullets, but it will deflect shell casings and your occasional rock from the coast. And here we see in 1916, Italian troops finally using machine guns and steel helmets. Here we see another group of Italian soldiers posing in armor. So if you're going to have to cut the barbed wire by hand, you might as well wear some steel armor. But of course, this reflected light. But they also have their own helmets, which weren't the standard issue helmets. And they're also carrying grenades. You can see some of all of these retro innovations in one piece. We could also talk about air surveillance. Both the Austrians and the Italians used airplanes to survey the battlefield and do reconnaissance of any enemy positions from the very beginning. And flight was, of course, a relatively new phenomenon that was put to use right away. But important for what I want us to think about was the development of bombers. By 1918, Italy had put into production a series of bombers, the last of which the Caproni CA-4 triplane, triple engine, heavy bomber, was capable of dropping 3,200 pounds of ordinary um, ordinances, conventional bombs. This was new. Austria-Hungary also used German Gotha IV bombers, which were smaller and could carry about a third of the size. But in the future imagination of these generals, we also learned and thought about bombing and using planes for bombing. Of course, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention poison gas. The First World War came about in what economic historians call the second, the middle of the second industrial revolution. This was a revolution in chemical production. The first revolution, uh, industrial revolution was about energy and the second was about chemicals. The Germans first used it at the Battle of Ypres in 1915 but it was then developed on a large scale by everyone, including the US. And one of the most famous uses of gas where it actually worked, because it usually didn't affect the battlefield because advancing troops, gas was also part of the call to the offensive. You send gas on your opposing troops and they're 
either demoralized or sick or, or dying, and then you rush in and take their positions. It was an offensive weapon, but soldiers usually don't like rushing into a gas cloud. Um, and oftentimes, if they hesitated too long, reserves wearing gas masks from the second line would take the place of the first line, and no territory was ever gained. But the, one of the more famous uses of gas was the Twelfth Battle of the Isonzo, which is more famously known by the, the Italian name for the town where the battle hinged, Caporetto. Caporetto is actually Cobarid, Slovenia. It's still there. You can go see the World War I Museum there. It's a wonderful place. And it's right on the river Isonzo. Caporetto happened, it was the 12th Battle of the Isonzo, November, October and November 1917. Austria-Hungary, after, after defending itself 11, after, through 11 assaults, decided that Italy was so weak that maybe it could launch a counteroffensive if only it had extra troops from Germany. So it asked Germany to provide extra troops. Russia had been virtually knocked out of the war by this point, so Germany finally relented and sent extra, extra troops, including a unit commanded by someone by the name of um, Erwin Rommel, who was only a lieutenant but he commanded a, um, a group of mountaineers at this battle. And rain and clouds prevented the Italians from being able to observe everything that was going on behind the Austrian lines. Seven German units, five Austro-Hungarian units, concentrated, 17 divisions in total with 1,000 heavy artillery pieces, 174 mortars, 1.5 million shells being stockpiled, and 230,000 steel helmets. They began the offensive on the 24th of October. German-Austrian artillery bombarded the, and obliterated the Italian lines. And the general of the Italian Second Army, who did not believe in, def in defending anything, didn't order his troops to dig in. The Italian Second Army at Caporetto melted away, and as the Germans advanced along with the Austro-Hungarians, they surrendered or deserted en masse. The people who were surrendered, we have multiple records of them coming up to the German or Austrian soldiers and saying, thank you for ending the war. The statistics of Caporetto reflect something important here. 12,000 dead on the Italian side, 30,000 wounded. This was not a large number of casualties for the First World War. Th close to 300,000 POWs, 350,000 deserters. They abandoned 3,000 guns that were captured, like heavy guns, 300,000 rifles, 3,000 machine guns, 1,600 motor vehicles, and the Italian army was forced to retreat by 150 kilometers. The army melted away. Cardona, the, the general, blamed the troops for not defending. It's all their fault. But of course, the troops weren't willing to fight anymore for someone who wouldn't provide them helmets and kept telling them to charge in machine gun fire. A year later, the same thing happened to Austria-Hungary. And of course, Austria-Hungary collapsed, as a res not as a result, but in, in tandem with the Battle of Vittorio Veneto in October 1918. To get a fuller picture, maybe, 100 years on, we're celebrating the 100-year anniversary of the end of the First World War, the official end. Though for many people, the war dragged on in, in through the 1920s. But to get a fuller picture of the relationship, I think, between technology and industry and the First World War, we have to examine not only the war itself, but the future war that generals who went to war went with, on the one hand, and the future war that the armistice itself interrupted. Because that changed. The idea that manliness and charging straight ahead was going to win the war that was coming to an end by 1918. And there was a new idea of how war should be fought that was beginning. So we have to think about what 
what did the armistices or armistices, armistices interrupt? The Allies and the Americans especially were developing a new poison gas called lewisite that combined the blistering properties of mustard gas with the poison, poisoning properties of arsenicals. And the British and the Americans were putting plans together to outfit bombers with this gas and deliver them to civilian centers behind the lines. An Allied inspection tour of Germany in 1919, that is after the armistice, inspected chemical factories. And this, the inspectors were worried about the ability of factories to produce fertilizer and synthetic dyes in peacetime, but chemical weapons in times of war. The report that the inspection team authored remarked that, quote, in the future, every chemical factory must be regarded as a potential arsenal, end quote. Scientists and civilians had been drawn into the First World War as a result of trying to help break the stalemate, but they'd also been drawn into the imagination of, of generals as future targets. In the future, with the creation of long-range bombers and the improvement of flight technology, things that were happening as a result of the stalemate in the First World War, civilians were now fair game because they were working in factories to support the war effort or working on scientific inventions. In other words, the First World War began with an imagination in which honor and tradition trumped technology. The belief in the offensive and securing of a quick victory through brave assaults on enemy positions died on the fields of the Asanso and in the fields of Flanders. The stopgap measure that generals used called for more troops. Call-ups mustered more souls to be sacrificed on every front. And what finally broke Austria-Hungary as well as Germany was a lack of manpower. The US coming into the war with lots of new healthy bodies to be thrown at German bullets was just too much. And the Germans and the Austro-Hungarians knew they were finished. But what really changed in the way that technology and war were related changed was this imagination of a future war. As scientists and inventors were called to the colors and biplanes became bombers to be deployed against factories and civilian centers, the imagination of the war changed and how technology should be used in a war. And I don't need to remind you that poison gas no longer needed to be used in war. As the Allies were planning to bomb German civilians with poison gas, the Germans, of course, used it to kill their own citizens of Jewish origin. I know I left you on a downer, so I've included some two nice rodent fo photos of, of the front lines. But I just, want to, I just want to point out that we're still trying to roll back in our society where our imagination went after the First World War. It's 100 years later, and we're still trying to roll back from the total war and devastation that we could imagine at the end of the first. And I think largely as a moral question, as an ethical question, we, we need to think about these things. And so I'm happy to do this alongside of you, and I am deeply honored that you've spent the last 45 minutes listening to me. So thank you very much, and I'll be happy to take any questions you have about this front or about Austria-Hungary or about whatever. Thank you, Dr. Dan. Thank you. Thanks, Paul. I'm Paul Starkey. I'm Paul Starkey. I'm the Provost and Vice President for Academic Affairs here at Penn College, and I want to um, thank Dr. Dayak for joining us tonight. We do have a couple of folks with microphones that if you do have a question, raise your hand. They'll come to you, and that way everyone will be able to um, hear your question as well as John. Okay. I'm also generally friendly. <laughs> Tell us about this thing. What is that thing? That's the uh, first picture you had of. You know what? <laughs> that was I have no picture. idea about that thing. 
That was done by, I didn't, I've never seen that thing before, but that thing looks pretty awesome. Um, Capture, capture Italian piece is what it said. It's yeah. Domain, but I'll send you the, the yeah, I, I want to do more. Re I mean, I, I just saw that. Well, I, I saw that as the poster came up, and I didn't do my due diligence and research. But I didn't design that. That was the, the wonderful team here at, at Penn College who designed that. But they found things that I haven't found, um, which tells you about the talent here. The guys are top notch. Yeah, sorry. So we have a question over a here on the. John, we have a question on the left. Uh, yeah, I was wondering about uh, what's your take on the fact that Americans were one of the only armies to actually employ shotguns in World War One? It's a lot more effective than a than a, a Lee Enfield with a bayonet on it, right? I mean, I mean, like, like, why did they? Specific, why was America the only one to actually? Fly? We came to war very late, um, and we came to war after. Um, after a lot of these lessons had been learned. Um, and for some reason, um, our generals decided to listen um, to what was, what was being learned by the, the, the French and the British. We didn't learn a lot of their, all of their lessons. The French were like, you want to assault those lines? Go ahead, we're gonna stand back and watch. Um, the French didn't launch any more assaults on the Western Front after 1917. They, they launched murderous assaults at the beginning of 1917, and the French army mutinied and the generals were unwilling to send them into assaults anymore. And that's why they needed the Americans to come. Um, but at least we have outfitted them with shotguns. If we're gonna make them fight in close quarters and trenches, you know, thank you for the sniper rifle, this is useless. Um, but it's just, yeah. But yeah, shotguns were a lot more effective. And you know, I think I'd rather a shotgun than a mace I'm mean, not really a violent person, um, but I just feel safer. Yeah. Question right. Uh, this is more stuff in the immediate aftermath of the war. Sure. Uh, but related to it, of course, um, especially the Asanzo, I was thinking about the Arditi, the Italian mountain mm -hmm. troops who became important in kind of the mythology and founding of fascism in Italy. Uh, and their dagger, of course, mm -hmm. became a, a symbol of that. But fascism in Italy had kind of this, going back to technology, uh, this kind of cult of modernization and technology tying into the, the futurist philosophy and yeah. stuff. And that country in, in World War I and following was largely rural, mm -hmm. uh, not very industrialized compared to the other Western powers. So how, how did kind of the experience uh, of the under-industrialized, maybe under-mechanized Italian army kind of lead into friendly, uh, people being willing to embrace this kind of cult of technology that accompanied fascism after the war? Uh, that's a books have and will be written about this topic. That's an amazingly like important question for historians of Italy. And I'm not an historian of Italy, but I can give you, a, I can give you my best take on it since you asked for my take. Um, and that is, in many, many of the generals who commanded Italian troops during the war, believing in the cult of the offensive, blamed the troops for their lack of the lack of manliness um, in the First World War for Italy's failure to take this front when Austria-Hungary was fighting a three-front war. And they didn't blame themselves. And this cult of sort of manliness ties into fascism very deeply. Mussolini personified it. So first of all, we have to be good gender historians and sort of understand this, how this cult of manliness comes from um, dissatisfaction with the army, with the general army, um, and ties into society in general and how the press uses it. At the same time, um, you know, Mussolini also and, and the Italian fascists also did embrace this kind of futuristic technology look as sort of creating a new man. Rural Italy, Catholic Italy, failed to create manly people to win wars. We need to remake Italian men. And to do that, we need 
we need new technology. We need to sort of embrace new technology and be the, the supermen of the future. And we need to make sure that we reclaim our manliness from this lost war. So I think these kind of things go together. I'm not typically a, a historian who uses gender as a category of analysis to do these things. But I think there it's really important to sort of think about the sort of the manliness and how they, they didn't do a good job. And this, is, this comes from the general's excuses about why they were losing. It's not our fault, it's the troops' fault. You know, why these guys can't stop machine gun bullets and keep running, I don't know. Yeah. We have time for one more question over here on the left. I'll get you out. My question is the nature of uh, urban myths or myths that appear after the war. Sure. Uh, let me give one brief example. Uh, everybody in my family, if they weren't women in war work, they were on the front line or somewhere in the World War II. Mm -hmm. And uh, the 1960s, I grew up hearing how we were on the winning side, but we lost the war because German and Japanese cars were coming into the country. <laughs> uh, well, anyway, I'm a student of economics, and I just heard a few months ago from a Vietnam veteran Marine, and he was whining about how we won World War II, but we lost it because the German and Japanese are so successful. And I said to him, not having studied economics, I said, what the hell are you talking about? <laughs> we were 20, 25% of global GDP before World War II, and now we're 20, 25% in the long run. We and we have good friends who, who, who like us for helping, uh, yeah. for helping them rebuild their economies, yeah. Yeah, and uh, those, the, I mean, do we want to keep sending flour and materials over there to sustain them? Or, I, I straightened them out right quick, and he good. Like, dropped that. You're that, a good educator. I, I just can't believe, though, that 70 years uh, plus after World War II, plus after the 60s, there, that people have this weird idea that they're on the winning side, but that we lost somehow. And I straightened them out that, you know, uh, Hitler was defeated. Japanese women would have never gotten the right to vote. J Japan's been pacified in a sense, and uh, it's a better world. But uh, I'm stunned uh, to hear that there's other myths out there. Like Italy was on the winning side, but I get the feeling uh, there was yeah. a mi urban myth or a, a myth that evolved that somehow on the winning side, but they lost. Can yeah. you, uh, any comments on that would be appreciated. That, Thank you. That definitely reflects the mindset and how fascism was able to sort of bite and hold into Italian society so, so very well. Um, they perpetuated this myth that they fought in the First World War and, st and were on the winning side and still lost. And it was, it was because mon many of their appetites for territory were left unfulfilled, although they, there are parts of Italy today that are still German-speaking after 100 years. Um, and of course, the, you know, Gustav becomes Gustavo during the Winter Olympics, um, so that no one, no one is reminded that he's actually from a German ethnic community in, in Tyrol. Um, I mean, these sorts of things, they're perpetuated because they're, they're so strong and they're mobilizing. But Italy used this to great effect um, to create a, a culture of discontent um, with, the go with the current government and overthrow it. Um, so these are strategies used by opposition that, you know, we did everything we could and we were still screwed. Um, and that's an amazing mobilizer. Um, I've heard it too, I mean, about the Second World War. But, you know, I have, I have relatives in the steel mills who are in the steel mills in Pittsburgh, um, taking sledgehammers to Dotson's. Um, yeah, don't want to mess with my cousins. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's, it's a myth that gets perpetuated over and over again. Um, and it's a myth that um, because the First World War was ended so, everyone had competing ideas of what the ideal situation would be afterwards. And there was no way to make everyone happy. Um, and so everyone, almost everyone in the First World War ended up being a loser in some regard. And so everyone wanted, had, was dissatisfied and wanted to revise the system. I think it's at our gut level of human nature where we want, but we don't get paid enough. Right, we'll yeah. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm, uh, people tell me I'm well con um, compensated at Notre Dame, but you know, 
people don't really know my true value, <laughs> you know? Um, yeah. Yeah, I think it's part of human nature. And I think it's a great mobilizing, a way to get people to do what you want. You, you shoot electricity through them like they're magnets and they all stand in line and march in the same direction. Yeah, I think that's a great question. These are wonderful questions. Dr. Dayak, I want to thank you. We, um, we do have time um, after this to visit with Dr. Dayak downstairs. We're going to have some refreshments in the area of our building we call Rapture. So down one floor and just to the north, um, Dr. John has agreed to Absolutely. hang around and answer questions, have conversation with uh, all of you as long as you would like. We can talk Notre Dame football if you want. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good year to talk Notre Dame yeah, football. It is. Um, I want to thank John for coming tonight and, and offering this um, very good talk. I want to thank the Hesburgh Lecture Series for um, allowing John to come and supporting him. I want to thank the um, Notre Dame Club of Greater Williamsport for supporting this. We, we thank you for reaching out to Pat Marty, um, who is an alumnus in himself, and um, for partnering with Penn College and the Colo um, Technology and Society Colloquia Series. And um, John, we appreciate your talk and we appreciate your time here and working with our students all day today. Um, join us downstairs for more conversation and refreshments. And please mark your calendar for March 21, 2019. Our next colloquia speaker is Sophia Breckner, who is from the University of Michigan. Um, so, yeah, I know, I knew that wouldn't go over well, but uh, <laughs> Sophia, Sophia will be um, discussing the intersection of art and science. Um, so she has some interesting concepts. <laughs> Pat's still hissing over the <laughs> U, U Michigan. <laughs> um, but join us on the 21st of March for our next colloquia presentation. John, thank you, please join me. In